welcome to the podcast, Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path. And I'm your host, Mike Allen. I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. Nathan Hale, 1776, just before he was hanged for being a spy. We all know that story, right? Or do we? Did he really say that? What do we really know about Connecticut's official state hero? Well, thankfully, we have with us today Anne-Marie Charlin to sort through all the different interpretations of his life. You see, Anne-Marie is the site administrator of the Nathan Hale Homestead Museum in Coventry, and she's a native of Coventry, where Nathan Hale grew up. And now, why Nathan Hale is Connecticut's state hero. Nathan Hale, born in 1755, executed in 1776. If you do the quick math, he was 21 years old when America's first official spy was hanged by the British in New York City. Hale's capture and execution on the evening of September 21, 1776, occurred at the same time as a major incident in New York City. But I don't want to give away that part of the story just yet. Nathan Hale was born in the small town of Coventry, Connecticut, 16 miles east of Hartford. And Anne-Marie Charlin is the Nathan Hale Homestead Museum Site Administrator. She's been with the Homestead since 2012 and has been the administrator for the last six years. And as you can imagine, she has some fascinating stories to tell about Nathan Hale. You once told me a story before we started recording that you used to walk through the backyards and think, you know, Nathan Hale probably walked through these same fields as well. That's got to be pretty exciting that you are in the town where Connecticut's state hero grew up and, and you traverse those same fields as a, as a child and now as an adult. Absolutely. I grew up across the street from the house that Nathan Hale was tutored in. Oftentimes, I would sit and imagine what the property looked like back then. Did Nathan Hale take a shortcut across my childhood property to get to his tutor's house? It was amazing to be able to be that close to such a big piece of history. I really didn't understand the ripple effect of Nathan Hale until I was an adult working here at the homestead. I was giving a tour to a businessman visiting from China. And we got to a certain point in the tour, and the gentleman got very teary-eyed. You know, I'm wondering where this is coming from. And he stopped me, and he said that the story of Nathan Hale is the first story that children in China learn to translate to English because he is the epitome of what a hero should be. He held himself with grace to the last moment. And even saying it now, it gives me goosebumps. I'm getting goosebumps, too. You know, some of the stories you tell, he grew up in a family of, I think, 10 children, but the amazing part here was that there was a one- or two-room cottage that they all fit in? Yes. His father purchased this property, they have 12 children, 10 survive to adulthood. They are all living in this little two-room cottage. I just it, it really think how amazing. Can you imagine what it was like? Eight boys, two girls, and then the parents. And he was not necessarily the healthiest of the surviving children. No, he was not. Nathan had a very sickly childhood. His lungs were not fantastic. But as he grew and he matured, especially when he reached his teen years, he becomes healthier and actually starts to excel as an athlete. How many of the Hale brothers or sons uh, served in the Revolutionary War? Six of the eight boys fought in the American Revolution. Now, before the war even begins... Nathan Hale goes off to Yale University to get his education. So he went to Yale at the age of 14. That was actually the average age for students at Yale at that time. While there, he is doing athletics. He actually breaks the New Haven record for long jump. He joins a secret society. He meets Benjamin Talmadge, who has his own 
special spot within our history of the American Revolution. He becomes a spy master. So this is really where he sheds his small town skin and comes into his own. Now, Talmadge would go on, of course, to form the famous Culper spy ring. We actually do have a letter between the two of them in which Talmadge encourages Nathan to join the revolution. He tells him, this is your duty. You cannot sit idly by. We kind of feel that that might be what drove Talmadge into becoming this mastermind spy ring leader because of the guilt he felt for his friend losing his life. The Culper spy ring starts after Nathan's death. Amazing. Now, he didn't go right to the Revolutionary War. He spent three years teaching in uh, East Haddam and New London, and he had a special thing that he did in New London. So he graduates in 1773. Then he becomes a teacher in East Haddam for one year. He does not like East Haddam. He feels it's the sticks. He's really kind of bored. So he gets another assignment in New London. Well, he loves New London. So this is where he wants to be. So girls were not receiving educations back then, uh, or formal educations, really. But Nathan knew that wasn't acceptable. And he started his schoolhouse every morning from 5 in the morning to 7 in the morning. Girls came in and received an education. At 7 a.m., the girls had to leave. Boys came in for a full day's education. Fascinating side of him that a lot of people, I'm sure, don't know. Let's talk about his spying uh, activities. And so he eventually, I guess, listens to Talmadge and says, yeah, I've got to go into the Revolutionary uh, War and, and do my service. And he becomes a member of Knowlton's Rangers, as I understand it. And from there, gets a communication from George Washington. Can you tell us this story? We're really kind of suffering. George Washington needs information, and he puts a plea out that he needs someone to volunteer to spy, to go over enemy lines and report back where the British are in camp and how many are in camp. Well, no one steps forward at first because if you're thought to be a spy, that says something about your character. Even though you're spying for our side, you're willing to do some dirty deeds. You're willing to lie. Not to mention, if you're captured, you're going to be executed. George Washington puts the plea out again. He reaches out to Knowlton and says, I really need you to put someone forward. Nathan steps forward and says, I'm willing to do it. Well, we send this 21-year-old kid off with zero training whatsoever. Nathan went to New York. He was spying. He thought, go with what you know. And he went as a Dutch schoolmaster. He is captured and he is executed. He was America's first spy. Uh, we don't necessarily celebrate that Nathan was America's best spy, but he stepped forward when no one else would. He held himself with dignity when he was captured. You know, and he has some very famous last words. He is credited with the quote, I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. Now that quote, there are a couple of different takes on what happened in his last 24 hours. So he's he's spying, he talks to the wrong person, a guy named Robert Rogers from Rogers Redcoat Rangers. Hale admits what he's doing and Rogers has him arrested, and this is the night of uh, September 21st, 1776, and the very next day, September 22nd, is when he's executed. And the day after that, William Hull, who was an American captain who knew Nathan Hale, was at one of these truce flag meetings where the two sides would get together and talk about prisoner swaps and whatnot, and nobody would shoot each other, and they would get together and talk. Hull was told, as I understand it, the very next day about this quote that you just made and how noble Nathan Hale was during his last 24 hours. And then fast forward, some documents are found from a British loyalist in Connecticut named Considered Tiffany. That's the name, Considered Tiffany, 
who says, no, 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 actually, he immediately started trying to backtrack that he was a spy and denied he was Nathan Hale and went to the uh, gallows as a, you know, sort of a, not the standard we think of. When you hear these kinds of conflicting stories and you know the story better than anyone, where do you come down on all this? I think there's a little bit of truth in all of the different versions. The capture story that I believe to be true, and it is a leading story with most historians, is that Robert Rogers creates a unexpected meeting with Nathan. So now Nathan thinks he's going into this tavern. He thinks that Robert Rogers it just happens to be there. And the two strike up a conversation. And they're getting very, very friendly. Robert Rogers lets it slip that, oh, I'm a spy for the Continentals. Nathan walks right into that trap and says, oh, I'm a spy as well. Rogers then goes as far as to have a party in Nathan's honor. Nathan thinks he's among like-minded people. He's sharing very openly. Meanwhile, the party is being surrounded and he is going to be arrested. And he spends the night where the party was happening in their greenhouse, and he's executed the following morning. Now, for his quote, that too, it seems like it's under scrutiny all the time. Did he say it? Did he not say it? As you mentioned, in a meeting, Hull hears the recount, and he is told this quote. Well, why would the British share something that would make our side sound like so good, really. You know, I mean, it just doesn't seem like that's a lie they would make up. So definitely, I believe whole story to be a little more accurate than somebody who was a Tory, which Tiffany was a Tory. We also know that when Nathan was at Yale, he studied the play Cato. And his quote is not a direct quote from Cato, but it can be interpreted from a quote within Cato. So it's kind of sending a message because this was a very well-known play. The British would have known it as well as the Americans. Well, you make a good point about why would they make him look good, particularly the way he was treated. I mean, he was summarily executed. He did not get a court-martial Uh, He didn't get access to a Bible, which in those days was considered uh, appropriate. Uh, They took the last communications that he wrote and uh, opened them and never delivered them. Uh, They treated him kind of horribly in that respect, you know, and then to go and say, well, he made this brilliant quote just doesn't seem to add up. They even stated he held himself with grace to the last possible moment. He did request a Bible and was denied He requested a man of the cloth be present, and they denied him that as well. He did request, could he write two letters, one to his commanding officer, Thomas Knowlton, and one to his family. Nathan didn't realize Thomas Knowlton was killed in the Battle of Harlem Heights just prior to his execution. Nathan is at what we now know as the intersection of 66th Street and 3rd Ave., They're fighting in a battle in Harlem Heights, and neither one knows what's happening to the other. Other than 9-11, the worst fire in New York City history uh, occurred the same night that he was captured. 20 to 25 percent of Manhattan burned. Not so many people died in it, but it was more the property damage. It was this horrific fire, and it was shortly after the British had retaken New York City and pushed Washington's army out. And there was a lot of rumor at the time that the Patriots were going to torch New York City uh, in retribution, but Congress said don't do it. Uh, and a lot of people that you know I've talked to say, well, this is one of the reasons Nathan Hale went to the gallows so quickly was because they were angry. Absolutely. They were making an example and sending a message. Another way they sent a message through Nathan is they don't execute him and cut him down and send his body back to his family. Uh, He's left to hang for five days as a message that if you're going to cross us, this is what's going to happen to you. Uh, Back on the farm, what they heard was someone by the name of Nathaniel Hale was captured and executed as a spy. They're holding out all hope that it is not their Nathan. And then his body is cut down and just discarded. 
we do not have Nathan's body. There was no closure for the family in that way. Now, it also brings us to the sort of wrap-up here where we talk about how Coventry has honored this hero. And one of the things they did in the 1800s was to build a monument. And it it took some time, from what I understand, to raise the money and whatnot to do this. But I've seen this monument. It's very impressive. Tell us the story behind that. So we have a very large monument at the front of what was the town cemetery during that time period. The town came together. They pick Nathan to be the hero. And so there is that monument for him. And really, in just recent years, we have a statue for Nathan in 2012. If you follow Nathan Hale's eyes by way the crow flies, the statue is positioned perfectly to match where Nathan Hale Homestead is on the opposite side of the lake, because Coventry Lake is between the statue and where Nathan Hale Homestead stands. Here we have the statue of his hands bound behind his back, and his gaze is looking towards his home. What often happens, unfortunately, from my personal view with history is we rip it down and put up a parking lot. And what happened in the early 1900s, a gentleman named George Dudley Seymour more or less made certain that the Hale Homestead would be here in perpetuity. That's a great story if you could share. So George Dudley Seymour was a patent attorney from the town of New Haven. He read a poem by Francis Miles Finch called Nathan Hale. It is a very long poem, but it is absolutely beautiful. Just the first few lines of it are, To the heartbeat a drumbeat a soldier marches by. There is color in his cheek, there is courage in his eye. Yet to that heartbeat and drumbeat, in a moment he must die. I mean, the imagery is just beautiful. That stuck with George W. Seymour, and he never forgot his interest in Nathan Hale. So he came across a letter that had been written over 100 years prior. It is Nathan Hale's niece, Rebecca, who has written it. And in that letter, she says, well, there's only one actual image of my Uncle Nathan that I know of. And it's on the back of a door at the old home bed. So George Dudley now needs to find where Nathan Hale grew up. So he finds the homestead. It's actually being used as a chicken coop in 1914. So he comes inside, and he's looking on the backs of all of the doors, and he finds it. He finds the only actual image there is of Nathan Hale, and we still have it hanging here in the house. And this is what convinces him to purchase the house. Now, before he purchases the house, he did what any gentleman would do, and he stole that door right off the hinges, took it to New York, had the paint professionally removed to really authenticate that this was the image that Rebecca was speaking of. He purchases the house. He never lives here, but he parties here on the weekends, and he brings very famous people to the homestead former president, both sets of Roosevelt, former president Taft. These are the types of people he's hobnobbing with. He's actually the gentleman that saved Nathan Hale Homestead. He also preserved the land around the homestead for the Connecticut State Forest. So many historic homes have been built up around, and now they're right in the middle of a neighborhood or city. We are surrounded by our 17 acres that we own and then uh, 1,500 acres of forest. So when you're here after dark, this has to be as close as you're ever going to come to the 18th century. There's not light pollution. The sky is a blanket of stars. It is quiet. You can really just sit and let your imagination step back in time. That wraps up this episode of Amazing Tales from Off and On, Connecticut's Beaten Path. 
Do yourself a favor and pay a visit to the Nathan Hale Homestead in Coventry. You'll see his actual military trunk and just a slew of other artifacts. And say hello to the site administrator of the Nathan Hale Homestead Museum, Anne Marie Charlin, who was our guest on today's episode. Well, if you like the show, go ahead and tell your family, friends, and colleagues to tune in, log on, and follow the podcast. Amazing Tales from Off and On, Connecticut's Beaten Path is a production of True North Associates, LLC. This is Mike Allen. Be safe and stay healthy. Music